came across a while a while ago uh, the concept of surface code, uh, and I have absolutely no idea. I have absolutely no idea what it means. Also, the term um, magic state distillation, magic state. I remember uh, it was a while back. Uh, this is the this is the tweet that I made about. Uh, so anyone knows what magic state distillation is. And actually, Craig answered saying, replacing the surface the surface code can't natively do non non noisy T gates, but it can produce noisy T plus gate states. Uh, magic state distillation turns noisy T pluses into fewer less noisy T pluses. The denoised T states can then be cons consumed to apply T gates via via gate teleportation. Um, I kind of sense where th this is going, and it might have to do with noise reduction, maybe. And maybe. so, I, and then there's this this post this post already uh, as well here uh, called the slightly smaller surface code S gate. Um, let's go through this. Recently, I was trying to learn more about the surface code by reading through the 2012 paper, Surface Codes Towards Practical Large-Scale Quantum Computation by Alistair Fowler. The paper is great. It uses lots of concepts and ways of thinking about quantum states that I'm not used to. Oh, nice. Then, I'll, then I'll, I should probably dive into this as well. However, there was one notable exception to the pattern, the SCIT construction. In Fowler et al.'s paper, the native operations available to the surface code are C0, H, X, Y, and Z. There is a significant difference between the Pauli gates X, Y, Z and the H and the C0 gates. Namely, the Pauli gates can be performed within the control, within the control software without actually doing anything extra to the qubits. The Pauli gates don't use up any volume. They are effectively free. The difference in cost will be important. Non-native gates are performed with combinations of the native gates, often aided by specially prepared ancilla states. For example, in order to perform the S gate, Austin keeps reusing the ancilla state. Oh, why? I've thought about this kind of gate from reusable ancilla construction in the past. In fact, I came up with the exact same S gate ancilla that, uh, in the paper. Okay. As soon as I saw the above circle in the context of the paper, knowing the Pauli gates are cheaper than C0 and uh, Hadamard gates, I had to try optimizing it in Quirk. Okay, I'll take a look at this later, I guess. As soon as I saw the... Okay, uh, da -da 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 -da. And it worked. It turns out that the outside Hadamard gate is simply fixing a phase flip of the ancilla state. You can use the Z gate instead. Okay. Actually, within the context of the surface code, Pauli gates are so cheap that it feels misleading to draw a whole box with a Z inside it. <laughs> a more cost representative way to draw the circuit is like. Ah, come on. Know that this is basically... It might be a little noisy. Give me a second. Okay, readjusting the, the mic. Okay, the mic. Know that this is basically the same circuit that we started with, but with the outside Hadamard removed. Uh, it's not very often that you make a circuit better by simply dropping an operation, sort of. Austin Fowler is one of my co-workers, so I sent him an email noting this silly little optimization. It would be unfair to say that Austin was excited, but anything that makes the surface code even slightly closer to practical tends to make his day. So that was good. Austin and I also happen to be fans of the idea of publishing these little discoveries by themselves. Globbing something like this into the background of a larger paper just makes it harder to find. Sure, it won't meet the significance criteria of a journal, but it's still worth putting it, putting it out there. So with that in mind, I set out to write the shortest paper I possibly could. I had an abstract. The abstract said to look at figure one, and figure one was the old circuit followed by the new circuit. Also, there was a reference. It took 
all of half of a page. Austin did, didn't find the extreme brevity as funny as I did, unfortunately. He fleshed out the paper with some justification, a more appropriate set of references, and some follow-up diagrams. The result is now on the arch on the archive. Okay, on the archive. Uh, a slide. <laughs> okay. Discussing Reddit. Uh, so there's actually no Reddit discussions. basically takes me to the paper okay let me just maybe dive into what surface code is and um, surface code to do, 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 do so let me just PDF only see if I can open that It's 54 pages. Oh my god. That's huge. Okay. Let me just do a quick scan. Let's just do a quick scan. What the? Sorry, I zoomed in too fast. <laughs> This article provides an introduction to surface code quantum, compu quantum computing. Okay, that seems like I just opened up another box. Awesome. <laughs> we first estimate the size and speed of a surface code quantum computer. We then introduce the concept of the stabilizer using two qubits and extend this concept to stabilizers acting on a two dimensional array of physical qubits on which we implement the surface code. We next describe how logical qubits are formed in the surface code array and give numerical estimates of their fault tolerance. We outline how logical qubits are physically moved on the array, how logical qubits are physically moved on the array, how qubit braid transformations are constructed, and how a braid between two logical qubits is equivalent to a controlled knot. We then describe the single qubit Haramard. S and T operators completing the set of required gates for a universal quantum computer. We conclude by briefly discussing physical implementation of the surface code. We include a number of appendices which one okay. It seems like the surface code is just just how you would implement the other operations by combining um, the actual native ones in your in your quantum machine. Instead of the surface code approach to quantum computing, we have attempted to maximize clarity and simplicity while perhaps sacrificing some rigor. The article is targeted to an audience with a good grounding in basic quantum mechanics, but assumes no additional knowledge regarding surface codes, error correction, or topological information processing. We do have assumed some prior knowledge of the basics of qubits in quantum computing, including familiarity with the single qubit operations, X, Z, phase flips, Harmar gate, to qubit control knot. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, yeah. Okay, background. Probably means software and products. This, so there's a bit of a background in here. I'll just do a quick scan first. Uh, uh, Trade-off between number of computational logical qubits. It's pretty dense. I'm, I'm, I want to see the surface code is there. All these tolerance local areas. One approach to building a quantum computer is based on surface codes, operated as operated as stabilizer codes. The surface codes evolved from an invention of Alexei uh, Kitev, known as toric codes, which arose from his effort to develop simple models for topological order, using qubits distributed on the surface of a toroid. The toroid toroidal geometry employed by Kitev turned out to be unnecessary in planar versions. This surface code, surface codes were developed by. Uh, in this publication, the critical logical 
CNOT operation was implemented using stacked layers of surfaces, a three-dimensional structure that significantly complicates potential physical implementations. Okay, so this seems to be actually a kind of quantum computing implementation. Tolerances, spatial, whatever. Qubit squared all of them. Using physical qubits. The 4000 computational logic will be the great all of them. 58 million physical qubits. Mm, introduction. Quantum computation, computation relies on the use of of qubits, which are two-level quantum systems. The prototypical two-level system is an electron spin. Yeah. In keeping with the literature on quantum computation, we'll be using the qubit operators X, Y, and Z. <laughs> Any two-level quantum system that satisfies the relations can, in principle, be used as a qubit. In fact, any system in which one can define the X and Y and Z operators can satisfy the relations. One it can be used as a qubit, even if the system has more than two degrees of freedom. Just having X and Z operators on a qubit is not sufficient, as a quantum computer needs a few more single qubit gates, as well as an entangling two qubit gate. Uh, how do I know? Efficiency gates, as well as two qubit controller gates. Uh, the matrix of precision is correct. In the surface code, physical qubits are entangled together using a sequence of physical qubit C0 operations with subsequent measurements of the entangled states, providing a means for error correction and error detection. Okay, a set of physical qubits entangled in this way is used to define a logical qubit which, due to the entanglement and measurement, has far better performance than the underlying physical qubits. Okay, so we'll describe how logical qubits are constructed in the surface code. Uh, okay. Kids and token allowing us to implement quantum organisms based on these logical qubits. Of a non same time measurement, MZ of qubit will have a return only when you know. Qubit errors can be modeled by introducing random X bit flips and Z phase flips operators. I kind of read that before somewhere that those are the error types that you're kind of mostly modeling. So a qubit, a qubit turning from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0, and or the a phase being flipped. If these errors are rare, the amplitudes for these operators will be correspondingly small. This modeling of errors can scrap a quite wide range of single qubit errors. Interesting. The operator model for single qubit errors implies that these errors can in principle be undone by quantum correction gates. An erroneous Z can be cancelled by subsequently applying an intentional Z. Since Z applied twice, it equals the identity. If we detect all the errors, we can correct them by repeatedly applying quantum correction gates. However, one feature of the surface code is that the error, errors only need to be corrected when they affect measurement outcomes, and thus one merely needs to identify errors and then correct any measurements that are affected by these errors. This can be done entirely in the classical system used to control the surface code, as we described in section 9. For example, a Z phase flip error that is detected immediately can be corrected by changing the sign of any subsequent X measurements, whereas an X error will have no effect on the same X measurement. Mm. We done in classical software.
one of the important aspects of the surface code is therefore a focus on error detection rather than error correction. Da -da 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 -da. Okay, just flying flying over some of those things. Kiss and state of the surface code. I mean, I'll I'll I'll, I'll I really want to dive into this. I don't 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 get me wrong. I just want to have a quick grasp first. But it's pretty dense, so I can't just. Uh, otherwise, I would just jump through the figures. The surface code. The two qubit stabilized example demonstrates a simple form of error correction. More complex circuits can detect and precisely identify errors in much larger assemblies of qubits. The surface code is the surface code is such an example. We implement the surface code on a two-dimensional array of physical qubits as shown in figure one. Figure one. Oh here. Oh fancy. Okay, what is this? This is figure one, yeah, yeah, figure one. So, um, we implant the surface code to the bachelor array of physical qubits as shown in figure one. The qubits are either data qubits represented by open circles in figure 1a, data qubits, okay, or measurement qubits represented by field circles. All of the data and measurement qubits must meet the basic requirements for quantum computation. All of the data and measurement qubits meet the basic requirements for quantum computation. Initialization, single qubit rotations, and two qubit control nodes you know, between nearest neighbors. In addition, in order to perform a topological version of the Hadamard, transformation, the data qubits and measurement qubits must be able to exchange their quantum states a swap operation a method to measure z for each qubit is also required but what is this b ah So this is identity G. So those are all control qubits and I, that's what is this? In addition, a method to measure the average curators and the measurement curators are. So it calls Z syndrome and X syndrome qubits in the surface code literature. Each data qubit is coupled to two measurements. Instead of the surface code, the measure Z measure X qubits that stabilize the surface code are operated in a very particular sequence. But I'm but what is these? Maybe I just just I should jump to into one of the references. What is this? Is it like an actual implementation of something? Is it a way to lay out the qubits, as in how you connect them to each other? Will it maintained by the subsequent cycle of the sequence? Single qubit errors. What else we got here? Figure two. Time.
Oh, so those. Those are operations. And so this kind of specifies the connections and then um, schematic evolution of measurement outcomes, field circles with plus minus signs over a segment of the 2D array, time progress moving up from the array at the bottom. Other types of errors, such as C naught errors, are discussed in 22 and also generate distinct patterns of sign changes in the measure X and measure Z qubits. Logical operators. How does one perform quantum logic in the surface code? It may appear that the surface code completely stabilizes the two. The array, and that it therefore locks the quantum system in a particular state, as in our earlier two qubit example. Logical operators, uh, we can see this. I really don't understand this. What is this green? Error hmm. detection. An example word measures that. Logical error rate for different error classes. Creating logical qubits. We have to discover one way to create logical operators by building array crossing chains of X and Z operators. However, as the chains of the operators must cross the entire array, this comes cumbersome for large arrays. Double Z cut qubit formed by turning off two measure Z qubits. But what is this greed? Ah. Hmm. Measurement figures. Geological qubits, moving qubits, mm. Mm. braiding two qubits. What? Braid transformation of a single Z cut. Is this a. What is this? So this is. This is. Specific implementation of. Uh, a specific implementation of. The actual circuits of the actual. Uh, initial 2D array for the logical Hadamard example. The spacing and size of the Z cut qubit holes correspond to a distance d7 d equals 7 to 2 holes in the center of the array of the array form the logical qubit that is a target for the logical Hadamard. And for which you display. HL and ZL. It's a bit late. The dashed box outlines the limits for what is shown. Okay, so it seems like this is. 
a way to kind of create operations or circuits by but I don't know what is this short qubits in state distillation okay physical implementations acknowledgements feel completely ready to approach that. Maybe you should Google a little bit. Or maybe what are the references 8 and 9? So one approach to building a quantum computer is based on surface codes. Operate as stabilizer codes. Okay, so this is really so this is really a way to build a quantum com a way to build a quantum computer. Okay. So I might not be completely interested into that in, in this, but let me check the references eight and nine. Uh, and this in here, this relation. So we decided to implement single control multi-target comes from our CCP, for example, in the distillation circuits used to purify purify imperfect states, as we shall see when we discuss the S and the T gates. Okay, so this distillation of whatever magic states are this seems to be sort of a concrete thing of those types of implementation. Of a quantum computer because you cannot natively do an S gate or a T gate with this way of building a quantum computer. So you kind of have to find a way around it and then you need, you need to kind of dual. Okay, but I can take a look at it differently. But references eight and nine, so let's go to the references. Scroll, 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 eight and nine. Quantum codes on a lattice with boundary. Ugh. I'll just open this for a second, another tab. I'll just copy this over. Uh, current codes and all that is boundary. So let's check this out. This is from 2008. A new type of local check additive quantum code is presented. Qubits are associated with the edges of a two-dimensional lattice, whereas the stabilizer operators correspond to the faces and the vertices. The boundary of the lattice consists of alternating pieces with two different types of boundary conditions. Homology groups. What is this? Okay, so this is, seems to be the basic concept. That's it. The other one it says no article identifier specify. Okay. Let's go back here. So recently I was trying to learn more about the surface code by reading through the 2012 paper, the surface codes. Um surface code the surface code let's check what is surface code quantum america i am studying quantum computing information i have crossed with the surface code phrase but i can't find a brief explanation of what it is and how it works hopefully you guys the surface codes are a family of quantum error correcting codes defined on a two-dimensional lattice of qubits. Each code within this family has stabilizers that are defined equivalently in the bulk but differ from one another. 
in their boundary conditions, the members of the surface code family are sometimes also called the toric code is a surface code with periodic boundary conditions. Uh, planar code is a larger surge area. Topological quantum memory surface codes. Yeah, that's what I the one I check. My block series interesting surface codes. Let's take a look at this. Oh, this is Tekodoku. Ah, James Woodon. <laughs> I haven't checked that. Okay. So let's take a look at this. Information as advanced. Surface cause. Yeah. So the story so far. Um, this is part of a project to get people involved in better error correction, see human information. In the next set of posts, uh, also there's already a linked. Um, okay, so this is sort of a series of posts. Um, I'm sorry, I was checking it in another tab. That's not the one you can see in the video. But so the next set of uh, will be moving on to the promised land. We'll start looking at surface codes. These are a way of coding quantum information that is especially awesome. They are the foundation of many research careers, including mine, and are the basis of the Dekodoku games. Before we embark upon this pilgrimage, we must prepare ourselves. We must reflect upon all that we have done thus far. So I'll let you, I'll tell you the story again, but this time I will, I will be a bit more abstract and a lot shorter. What is error correction? Sometimes we need to send information so we need safe information, but errors are always hiding around the corner. Error correction, the information we usually send and save is usually quite complicated, like Christmas lists and selfies. So let's just consider um, the most simple of all messages, the basic unit, uh, the bit. Yeah. Simplest type of error is that is a bit flip error. Good. Um, so a chance of this is one in a billion will okay, so match. Okay. What do we do is what we do is encode our information. We uh, no longer do we entrust our message to a single bit. Instead, we get loads of bits and get them all to carry our message together. There are lots of ways to do this. Some are more complicated than others. The simplest is just to set them all to the same value. If we want to store a zero, we'll set all the zero, all zero for a one. <coughs> we'll set them all to one. <coughs> Other uh, once a few bit flips happen, our encoding will get a bit messed up. It will no longer and ambiguously tell us what the message is zero or one. With the repetition encoding, for example, we might have our bits disagreeing. Some will say zero, some will say one. Who was lying? We need to work out what the original message it was, but it's called decoding. For repetition, we can just look at the majority opinion. Um, Measure slightly. See here for more info. So, what, where does this take us? Is the error correction? Okay, this seems to be number one, but this is like five of the story so far. Okay. Uh, quantum information. If our bit based the laws of quantum mechanics, it doesn't always just need to be zero or one. It can keep its op options open to be zero and one at the same time. Superposition, blah, 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 blah. This has to stop once we, uh, until then we can prod it in weird quantum ways and use it to do new quantum kinds of computation, communication, cryptography, qubit, Unfortunately, cubes are not immune against bit flips. They are even more prone to them. Error correction is again required. Cubes also experience another kind of error. It doesn't bother bits at all. It's called the dephasing. It happens when the horrible little gremlins come and look at our qubits. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so that's the that's the, the, the superposition kind of disappearing. It's not just the gremlins we need to worry about. It's, it's, it's us too. If we want to store information for a long time, we need to, we need, 
we need to do the coding regularly to find and remove any errors as they happen. But if we end up finding our, our first thing, because of these, we need a kind of a correction for qubits, okay. Dephasing. Both have, both have caused the phasing. Also, need to find places where the phasing has happened and, and sort that out too. So here, storing quantum information. Uh, okay, so that's kind of a summary of the of the missing quantum mass. How old are those posts? 2016. Okay. Decoding without looking as I was so some quantum error correction. Uh, I started this with the repetition encoding from before. Quantum seems to be zero. We set them all to zero. From any subversion of zero and one will be the subversion of being zero and one being one. In every case, every qubit should agree with every other. Any disagreement is a sign that a bit flip has happened. We just look for disagreement. One way to do that is to sit our qubits on a line. We then go along and ask every pair of next door neighbors whether they agree or disagree with each other. This tells us nothing about whether they are zero or one, so it doesn't affect the superposition. Instead, it tells us everything we need to decode without causing any defacing by looking at which qubits agree with each other. We can see which ones are in the in the majority. We can, yeah, okay. See, that's interesting, actually. That's actually pretty decoding without looking. That's pretty interesting. So sort of, yeah. Basically, you need to be able to detect those situations and correct them by kind of then reapplying gates, I guess. Correcting the phasing happens when we or the ground's final information we aren't supposed to. It happens when the kind of message which is supposed to be a superposition is forced to choose whether to be one or the other. If our quantum message is stored in a single qubit, there will be some probability that a Gramley will come and look at it, making a deface. If it's re if it is repeated across many qubits, there is a lot more places that the Gramleys can look at. They can find uh, zero by looking at it in many copies. Uh, so there's a lot more ways to make a deface. The repetition encoding, which protects against bit flips, are so well actually makes the phasing more likely. Mm. We need some truly quantum error correction. Let's go to the promise line and find it. Okay. So it's the next the next one is here, I guess. Um, the toric code. Let's go through this one and I'll stop here. Uh, Interesting. So the, this, we um, we want to build a quantum computer. For that, we need quantum bits or qubits. The ones we can build will always be too noisy to be used directly. We need a method to build relatively noiseless qubits out of many noisy ones. This is quantum error correction. In this post, we will start looking at one particular way to do this, the toric code. This is part of a family of codes called the surface codes, introduced over, de over, over a decade ago. When quantum computers actually get built, it seems most likely that it will be some variant of surface code that is doing the error correction. Okay. Pros and cons of repetition code. Before we look at the toric code, let's again think about the repetition code that, we can, uh, that can be used for error correction bits. And in the position where we take many bits, it's not easy to be useful, let's call the physical bits. We want them to build one bit that is not very noisy at all. So we've got the logical bit. Okay, yeah. Like the, the voids. If we want our logical bit to have zero, we'll, we set all the physical bits to zero. If we want, yeah, so then all, all these. So all these become like a logical zero, and all these become a logical one. Yeah. If noise causes some noise, when there was some like this, to find traces of these errors, we we'll look at each pair of neighboring physical bits and see if their value is the same or different. It should always be the same, but strings of bit flips will have a pair that are different at each end. Yeah. 
by finding these and pairing them up, we find the errors. We could also interpret these measurements a little differently. We can imagine that we add the two neighboring values. Don't look at this odd or even. Yeah. Even. Yeah. Yeah. That's another way of looking at it. Later in this pause. Suppose that we want to flip the value stored in our logical bit. We want to flip it from 0 to 1 or vice versa. So we do this. Okay. Ah, okay. I get it. Uh, now I started to understand, I think, what all that huge paper was trying to talk about. So the. Okay. So the, the, the grid seems to be. This, this seems to be the way to encode logical qubits. So to put physical qubits in a way that um, that we can easily detect the errors, but then, but but then when we when when you want to really program the quantum computer, you need to do your actual you know operations, and then the trick is how do you how do they translate in here? So how do you make an X? Right, so that's what we're saying here. It's like okay, in, in this classical example, like to negate that, you would just negate all all of them, right? So how would you apply a, a control knot? How you apply? How would you apply a knot? How would you apply a Hadamard? And in, in, in this uh, interesting, that's a deep call. Um, this is good because it wasn't an error that day. It was as unfortunately it is possible for errors to do this too. The probability of a bit flip error on every physical bit is very small, but it's possible. If this happens, it looks exactly like something that we might do on purpose. There is no way we could ever detect these errors. If they happen, we fail. Yeah. Um, bum, 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 bum. Unfortunately, obviously, we don't want to fail very often. So one probably to be small. For qubits using it to build a logical qubit for many noisy physical ones. It will make it rare for the logical qubit to get flipped. But as so unfortunately qubits suffer from another kind of noise, unwanted measurement. They are not restricted to just being zero or one. They can be a quantum in a quantum superposition of both at the same time if we it destroys the superposition uh, that we need for quantum computation. With the repetition code, we can measure whether it is 0 or 1 by looking at any of the physical qubits. This makes it very likely that something will interact with them and learn the forbidden information. So how do we protect a qubit from both types of errors? We need the following two things. Flipping our logical bit can only be done by flipping lots of physical bits. It shouldn't be possible to find out if the logical qubit is 0 or 1 by just looking at one physical qubit. It shouldn't be possible to find out if the logical qubit is 0 or 1 by looking at one physical qubit. Instead, finding out about the logical bit can only be done by looking at lots of physical bits. Now let's look at the code that does this, the toric code. For the toric code, we don't put our qubits in a line, we put them in a grid pattern. This grid has lots of squares. Qubits live in the little ones. Okay. Qubits live in the little ones, so we'll just refer to these as qubits. The big white ones are just called white squares, or we just call white squares. The smaller blue ones are blue squares. Okay. The edges of this grid are a bit odd. If you move off the top, you appear at the bottom. Ah, okay. And if you move off the right, you appear on the left. The half squares on the top and the bottom are actually different halves of the same square. In the repetition code, we looked at uh, whether the neighboring beads are the same or different value. We do something similar with the, in the Torah code, but not for pairs of qubits. Instead, we will do it for the four qubits around each of the white squares. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. So those are the ones that will determine the qubit, the logical. Yeah. Mm. So we'll do a 
four qubits around each other. Okay. We add up the four bit values for each of these squares and see whether the result is even or odd. What patterns of bit values have all even squares? Some examples below. You may be wondering about how the half numbers on the edges. The half numbers they will join up with the ones on the right when the wrap when we wrap this around torus. Uh, the example labeled A is the easiest of all. Everything is zero. So everything adds up to zero. Zero is even, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. <laughs> so all the squares are even. The one labeled B has a string of ones passing through some of the squares. When this string enters a square, we add one to that square sum. When it leaves, we add another one. As long as it leaves every square it enters, we will add two to the sum. Since two is even, the squares stay even. The only way the string to leave every square that it adds is for it to end up joining it, making a loop. If you had a A and a wanted B, mm -hmm. all you need to do is flip the beads around the loop. Oh, it's adds or removes a one where it's a square. Uh, No matter what the original bit values are, loops of bit flips never change whether the squares are even or odd. The two other examples have a string that stretches from left to right. This is also a loop, yeah, because it, it touches this the sides. The half squares that it passes through on the left and right. Uh, and see, we have the same bit values, but flip a particular line the half squares that it passes through are just halves of the same square yeah the two most important things to get from all these are when all squares are even the, when all squares are even the bit value looks like loops of ones on a background of zeros doing bit flips around a loop doesn't change whether any square is even or odd. Now we can start thinking about how to store information in this thing, but that'll have to wait until next time. Cool, I'll leave it here. Um, but that actually makes more sense. Uh, that, that's pretty well written. Um, that's pretty well written to expect from from, from James Wooden, actually. Uh, cool, perfect. So that that's that's it's interesting i mean it's definitely interesting it's one one of the one of the areas that i really hadn't explored until now it's maybe a bit far from what i originally set out to but I, I, that's that's actually important and relevant and um and if that's going to be part of of the way quantum computers are doing error correction that's definitely uh that's definitely relevant uh yeah perfect